setting the stage, gathering information, doing a little bit of um, thought provoking discussion. And on day two, today is really the work of the workshop. Um, so when you registered for this meeting, we had you were able to select a breakout session. And so Dave will be automatically putting you into those virtual rooms. And um, should you have any issues with, with getting there, um, please message him directly and he'll be able to work his Zoom wizardry to put you in the right place. So today you're going to be into, uh, into self-selected into your breakout sessions. And I just wanted to echo or reiterate, refresh your memory on some of the key themes that I heard yesterday. And this is not meant to be an exhaustive uh, list, but just something to jog your memory, get you thinking again, since we, we took an overnight break. So some of the themes that I heard yesterday were related to questions about implementation of existing treatments, whether that be um, evidence-based treatments for chronic pain or for opioid use disorder. There was some acknowledgement that perhaps new interventions might need to be uh, developed or flesh out. And I think this specifically came up when we talked about the utility of medications for opioid use disorder for the co-management of chronic pain and OUD. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about coordinated care and whether or not we wanted to adopt something like a collaborative care model, um, stepped up approaches to really integrate the professions uh, of the workforce who have special specialized knowledge in chronic pain or OUD. Um, I believe Jesse had brought up this sort of balanced intention between personalized medicine and a one fit, one approach fit all type of model. Um, and lastly, there was some discussion about addressing stigma, particularly in um, healthcare providers, um, and also mentioning whether or not we need to develop a new workforce that has sort of this specialized knowledge at, in the intersection of all of these comorbidities. So those were some of the themes. And as you come out into your breakout sessions, I would encourage you to also think about, um, okay, I see somebody else having trouble hearing. Can you guys- Shelly, you're going in and out. Oh, well, that's unfortunate. Does it help if I get closer? Shelly, I was able was to hear you no just problem. Just fine, Shelly. So it's not, I'm not sure it was Shelly. Yeah, I could hear her now. too, Lynn. I hear you fine, Shelly. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, th thank you that it's not, it's not me. Okay, perfect. So um, as you discuss these approaches, think about if there's other gaps that we perhaps didn't have time to mention or there just wasn't enough space to talk about as you, you go into your breakout sessions. And I would also encourage you to, to think about the healthcare setting in which um, these types of gaps may exist. I encourage you to think about under-resourced um, communities. Um, I encourage you to think about people of color and marginalized populations that we know we have evidence that they are less likely to receive medications for opioid use disorders. And we also know that, that healthcare providers are less likely to listen to their reports of, of pain. So, um, the, again, this is not supposed to be an exhaustive list. We just wanted to jog your memory of, of sort of some of the dynamic discussions that we had yesterday. So today, um, we want you in your breakout se sessions to, discover, to discuss um, three priority research infrastructure training workforce needs. I really want to emphasize that this should be a something that's accomplishable in a five-year time frame. So we'll need you to put on your NIH grant writing hat. We want you to be innovative and dynamic, but also some propose things that are feasible. And we want this to be um, a time where you have clear, actionable um, suggestions for NIH program. Think about what types of resources might be needed for successful implementation. I know this came up a lot yesterday. And importantly, we want you to think about how this vision of these three top priorities will drive the field and really make significant advancements in care for these complex patients. So Dave, if you could go to the next slide. 
Um, you'll have these slides in your breakout sessions. They were, these were just very concrete questions that we wanted to ask you. And of course, we don't want you to just go through the checklist of, of discussing these questions. This was, an, again, intended to sort of stimulate conversation within your, your breakout sessions and also ensure that there's some consistency across the breakout sessions so that when we come back together as a group, we're at least um, somewhat on the same page. Next slide, please. So um, I'm going to pause real quick to see if Leslie and if Lynn has anything that they want to add to sort of the scientific content of, the, of today's purpose. Yeah, hi, um, this is Leslie and thanks so much Shelly and that thanks for the reminder about what we um, you know, some of the key things from yesterday. And one of the things that really struck me as I was thinking about uh, the discussion yesterday, which Shelley also hit on, is just um, we heard repeatedly the need for a multidisciplinary team approach. And I think it would be really nice for us to hear what that needs to look like. How is that implemented? And how is it implemented depending on where the um, individual is first seen, whether it's a primary care physician, whether it's a pain specialist or an addiction specialist, and how do we get um, the, the, the expertise both in um, you know, substance use disorder as well as pain? What is the role for telemedicine and um, how do we capture the patient narrative as we're you know, thinking about this multidisciplinary team approach? And then we also heard that there's a dearth of research on um, treating people with pain that also have opioid use disorder. So what are the specific research needs there? I think those things are things that would be really interesting to hear more about. Thanks, Shelley. Lynn, Lynn would you like to add anything? Yeah, I, I just echo, I think, what Shelley and Leslie already highlighted. Um, and just in thinking about where our dearth of knowledge is, are there things that we can build into projects at a large scale, uh, measurement-based care, things that are very systematic that will allow us both to do the clinical trials, but to start to build the database to really look at these questions in a very broad population um, and, and to look towards some of the precision um, needs. Um, I was also really struck yesterday about the discussion about shared narrative and patient story and thinking about how do we, um, how do we consider some of that while we're also considering the logistic constraints of working in a, a variety of, of environments. So most of this work really calls for doing things in very embedded ways in healthcare systems but are there ways that we can capture um, some of that and also be very pragmatic about how we can, we can scale these things? So that's a, a really high charge, but I think one this, this group's up for. I'll stop there. Great, Dave, if you could go back a slide, this is more of the logistics. Okay, perfect, you're there. Um, so uh, Dave will automatically put you into your virtual rooms. And if you again have technical questions, please reach out to, to one of the hosts privately. Um, NIH program will be floating into these rooms and again we're not really going to be leading the conversations each session has a breakout lead and we really want to be the ones listening to what you have to say as experts in the field. Um, each breakout room will have a science writer who will be sharing his or her screen and be taking notes as you're discussing so again please have this be an organic flow of thoughts that that your group will have. You will all reach, uh, receive five, 15 five and one minute warnings. And um, from 11.30 to noon is when you're gonna have a break. Um, and so if you can go to the next slide, Dave. Um, so I think, I don't know if it's on this slide, but at some, about seven minutes before the group reconvenes, each session leader, so I think it's Kathy, Eric, and Barbara. You will be meeting with Lynn in your own separate room and you're gonna report out to her 
what your group identified as the top three priority needs that can be fleshed out in the next five minute, uh, five years. And then we're gonna, everyone's gonna come back together, together as a group because I'm hoping that there's gonna be some overlap and synergy occurring across the, the three breakout sessions. So um, after everyone has presented their, their work group's uh, vision, we will have time to hopefully discuss um, areas of synergy and overlap between the three topics. Is there another slide, Dave, uh, Dave or is that done? Are we done? You're done. Okay. So I would encourage you to be bold, be creative, be um, visionary. This is really an opportunity for you to, to reach for the pie in the sky type of, of deal. Again, feasible within a five-year timeline. Um, and so with that, I think um, if there's nothing to add from the planning committee, I think we can start moving into our uh, virtual rooms. I, I post this as well, I post it, uh, can you hear me? Um, I can sort of hear you. I'll move closer. I posted a question, Eric responded. Um, I wanna get clear before we go in the breakout, otherwise I think it'll be an area of uh, tension. Nothing about what you just said in terms of the priority suggested to me an interest in focusing on explanatory trials and to be focused on in the domain or on the continuum toward pragmatic implementation trials and studies on that end of the continuum. Is that clear or is it not so clear? So the themes that I mentioned was what I heard from everyone yesterday as priority needs. If you, within your individual work groups, identify explanatory or clinical trial type intervention designs that should be prioritized, I don't want to limit your group. Um, I was just echoing some of the themes that I heard yesterday. Can I just add uh, one comment to that is, is I wonder what, I, I don't know that they need to be mutually exclusive. In other words, I think it's worth talking about in the breakout in the midst of doing a very large scale trial that might be more pragmatic in nature. Can one also do some of the mechanistic work that undergirds that? And I think that, that, that there, there might be a sweet spot there. So I'd really welcome people talking about what kinds of research methodologies might allow that. Could I just make one brief comment about that? Mm -hmm. um, this is an observation from the being on the HEAL multidisciplinary working group. And one of the things that I, I noted in that entire funding portfolio was that there was absolutely no funding uh, specifically aimed at, at targeting new therapeutic mechanisms for the comorbidity of chronic pain and OUD or opioid misuse. Uh, all of that funding seemed to be oriented towards more on the pragmatic end of the spectrum. And so what I left those meetings wondering, where's the funding to actually come up with something new to help people with this problem? That, that was my read of those RFAs. And so, my, and this is Bob, well, I don't know what room, was that Eric? Yeah. Um, you know, my read of it was there was a heavy emphasis, maybe not specifically in this domain, but um, still way more on mechanisms and discovery than there was on trying to help people now. If this is truly a crisis now, then it seems like the moral imperative is to move things that we know work and figure out how to address the gap between evidence and practice. I just want to chime in and agree with you, Bob, that I I think I said this a few times yesterday in the chat box and maybe once or twice verbally, but I, I'm always frustrated by how much we know works that is not in, um, in widespread practice. And so not to say that other things aren't interesting, but in terms of prioritizing, I, I agree with you completely, Bob. And I'll make a recent, you know, the one, one study that I know was funded by HEAL was the Katie's project um, that addresses the uh, people with comorbid chronic pain and opioid use disorder. And as I understood uh, as a member of her DSMB, uh, that the study is 
getting bogged down in requirements about a lot of other measurement that is going to turn people away and undermine the pragmatic strengths of that trial. So, so one other comment that I'd like to make um, is, is that maybe for us to think broadly about um, various mechanisms that would allow some balance in some of this. So if you think about program projects of, of research where there, there are opportunities to do iterative, um, uh, you know, faster turnarounds, smaller embedded projects within that have the, the overall infrastructure but still maybe have it along a pragmatic platform. I think that this group is very uniquely positioned to, uh, to, to really make recommendations, I guess, back to the, the, the Heal Multidisciplinary Working Group and, and NIH about what would it take to strike that balance and where, um, you know, as Bob's saying, there are places where I think the, the intent is, is good to have common data elements and so forth, but where certain types of grants sitting in, in some of the sub-initiatives or, or certain mechanisms may not fit so well. So I think this is all part of the, the methodology and, and recommendations about how to move this work forward that's important. So I, I really appreciate, Bob, that you brought this up and, and Eric, your comments as well. So with that, I, I think, who was that? Oh, hi, this is Ajay. I just, oh. so what, is it okay? Can I? Sure, sure. We should start moving on, but please, please. Okay, you just brief. real quick. Um, so one other thing I heard Bob saying is that we need to actually in the working groups make this distinction between the need for explanatory trials, such as with the placebo versus effectiveness. And I think that's important because in my mind, that's actually been a, kind of a source of confusion at NIH for many years, particularly among reviewers, which is because, uh, you know, historically NIH is tilted towards explanatory versus effectiveness type of, of designs. And I think that's also the thing that Bob, he's shaking his head yes, I think that's also one of the things he's, he's getting at too, is articulating that, you know, and there, you know, there, you have the continuum that you talked about, Lynn, but I think we need to have some dis, dis, discussion of that one in any of our work products, because I think there is a lot of clarity that's needed. So again, we recognize the whole patient. We broke down the day by, by sort of subgroupings just to make things a little bit digestible. And within your working group, if you feel like, pragmatic trials versus sort of mechanistic trials are more important. We will hopefully come together and see a clearer picture of the entire landscape uh, when, when the breakout sessions come back together as a group in the afternoon. So um, with that, I think we should move to the breakout rooms because we're already just, I'm, I, I'm a stickler for time. So we're already three minutes over my spiel. So I think we should go ahead and move into um, our, our breakout groups. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Everyone, I'm going to move you to a breakout room. I think I have everybody assigned to the right room. If you are not in the right room, let the host, the co-host that's inside your room know. They'll message me and I'll move you to the right room. But I think I have everybody set. So I'm going to open the rooms now. What it'll do is it'll ask you to join. So just click join. It's going to remove your screen for a second. It'll spin and then it'll bring you into the room. All right, everyone. So here we go and have a great session.